So take it away, Neil. Welcome, everybody. We are uh, really excited to have Mark Shepard and Wayne Dorband on tonight. We, uh, for the next coming weeks, we've confirmed. Uh, I'm going for the next two weeks. I'm going to do the next two webinars. And then after that, our website and a lot of our hardware should be set up. And then we've got folks lined up for every week until the middle of January, with the exception of Christmas. We didn't have anyone for Christmas. So we're going to be sending that out. And uh, in the meantime, for tonight, Mark... Shepard is probably one of the very early pioneers in the U.S. who established a key line polyculture perennial farm system. And he, his system might be the oldest in the U.S. that's been running for uh, multiple decades at this point. Uh, that might sound weird to you, Mark, to say that this has been 20 years, but um, I think the system he's got and the stories he's going to share with us are something that all of us can learn from that are trying to operate on a farm scale regardless of what climate we're in. So I'm really excited to have him here. I'm thankful to all of you for joining us and giving us your time. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. All right. Thanks for the uh, kind intro, you guys. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And as far as the uh, one of the oldest sites in the U.S., it's not the oldest site by far. There's a lot of, uh, huh, what just happened to my screen? A whole bunch of stuff went crazy. Yeah, oh, we changed we, over to you. And it just, all right, there we go. Okay. Uh, there's a bunch of older sites, mostly at the uh, homestead and suburban scale. But this this is the uh, the oldest one at, at the farm scale. By farm scale, uh, the meaning is it's intended that it is going to be producing staple food crops uh, for, for the human diet, uh, utilizing wholesale markets instead of niche marketing or farmers marketing, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and so I guess a little bit of, of background got to come, has to come with this. This first slide obviously is an is a, uh, aerial photo of uh, New Forest Farm, southwest Wisconsin. This is actually uh, probably six or seven years old now. And one of the reasons why I show this one is because it really clearly shows the lines, and we'll get into that later about what those lines are all about. I didn't always start this way. I grew up in the, uh, in, uh, the New England states, mostly in Massachusetts as a kid, during the industrial collapse of the 1970s. And these are some of the buildings that were, uh, that were well known to me. Uh, uh, some of my best friends lived in this apartment right here. Uh, my cousins lived up here in that particular apartment. Uh, through whatever the political reasons uh, are, tax code changes, et cetera, you know, American industry began its collapse in the 1970s, and, and my parents both were uh, factory workers who uh, lost their jobs multiple times. Uh, my dad uh, had a couple of apartment buildings, had to uh, go bankrupt um, because of urban renewal projects. Uh, I think actually my uh, cousin still lives in this particular apartment here. This used to be like a little corner candy store. This is my favorite place in the world because this is what they used to call a department store. The, the, the downstairs was the greatest place in the world because you come down these stairs and right in front of you was like this pallet bin full of stuff and you never knew what was in that, in that bin. It was whatever all the leftovers were and you just wander through pallets and pallets and pallets worth of, worth of uh, toys. Downstairs was all the toy department. There was furniture and clothes. I never went upstairs. You know, would go into the into the building. My parents would turn us loose downstairs. Would run around like crazy until they were finished shopping and then come find us. <clears throat> it was during that time we lived on a uh, you know a multi generational family uh, uh, property. Uh, my grandfather had bought that uh, just prior to World War II. It's 15 acres, uh, narrow, skinny 15 acre lot. And it had been in Compass Agroforestry Systems since, uh, since they bought it before World War II. Uh, my grandfather and my dad's side of the family, they were Coppice foresters uh, all the way back to Wales. Uh, 1820s was when they first came to the U.S. They came into Maine. And it was at that time in, in Massachusetts where I discovered this book, Tree Crops, <clears throat> A Permanent Agriculture. It was originally written in 1926. Um, and Russell, J. Russell Smith's uh, original premise is, since so much of the annual crops that we grow uh, go to feed animals, 
why not grow tree crops and have the nuts and fruits and berries feed the animals, have grasses underneath to graze the animals. So let's feed the animals using a two-story permanent agriculture. That's our first place where I ever saw perma and culture together was in this book in 1926. Uh, <clears throat> what's interesting is today the situation is even more dire. It's now some 80% of all the annual crops are fed to uh, livestock uh, instead of human beings. Um, so this is where I kind of cut my teeth on. We've got to be able to, there's got to be a way that we can uh, live more nicely on planet Earth. We can actually help planet Earth, can't we, please? Uh, the big game when I was a little kid was to guess what color the river was. I think it was 1974 or 5 when the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught on fire and I kind of tugged on my mom's apron. That's back when mothers wore aprons and stuff. I said, hey, Mom, why did the Cuyahoga River make the news for catching on fire when ours does it every other week or so? I've seen this river, uh, you know, red, green. My favorite was this, like, cobalt, creamsicle blue flowing down. It's the most beautiful color in the world. Uh, it stunk like a sewer, and every time it would flood, it would regurgitate paper mache onto the banks. A friend of mine was uh, working, doing a science class project to take a water sample. He fell in and was hospitalized for a week. It's a real bad place. <clears throat> but what's really interesting, and this is from a 1993 National Geographic uh, magazine, on the right here, you see that the river is kind of running clear. What happened somewhere between the photo on the left and the photo on the right, enough forces came into place play to force uh, industry to install wastewater treatment plants. Once wastewater treatment plants were installed, the river like cleared up all by itself. I got to see firsthand that just stop harassing nature and it'll spring back. It has amazing um, you know, uh, vitality to it and it will come back and it will colonize, uh, colonize formerly degraded places. <clears throat> just more pictures of the river you know, back in the 1960s and then 2012. Um, I went to engineering school for a couple of years, not because I wanted to go to engineering school. I actually just wanted to be a bum. Uh, I failed to thrive. I went to that particular engineering school because I got a really cool scholarship and had a great wrestling team, and that was my thing at the time was um, getting my frustrations out by beating people up and having people cheer for me. Yay! Uh, <laughs> so I... I um, after engineering school, I got a job uh, working as an engineer, as a design engineer. Hated that, so I went back to school for ecology, and I ate it up, absolutely ate it up. Unity College at the time was the only 100% environmental college uh, in the USA. Everything from uh, being a game warden to national parks and rec management to you know rock climbing guide training, all that kind of stuff. I, I went to, to be trained as an ecologist. These are some of the texts that I use. So my my study of nature started when I was a little kid on the family homestead where we grew a big garden. Uh, we were, um, my parents were friends with Scott and Helen Nearing, who were pioneering heroes in the, in the 1970s. Uh, we were part of a biodynamic um, farming and gardening group. The president of the Biodynamic Association of North America was John Philbrick. He lived right down the road. So I was steeped in this gardening. And, and agriculture, and we can grow all of our own food in our small little front yard. And my parents, you know, my dad mostly, we had the biggest garden around, but we still had to go to the grocery store to grow, grow to, to buy our, our staple foods. So if, if our family was growing all of our food, why, why do people keep saying that we can grow all of our food in our front yard? And why did it, why did it suck to work in the garden out in the hot sun where you sweat? you got to hoe the weeds and transplant the plants and baby these plants. But if I went into the woods to go collect firewood or whatever, there were mushrooms and hickory nuts and hazelnuts and grapes and blueberries. I ate better in the woods than I did on, on, out in the garden. So I tried to marry the two. How do, how do I get some kind of ecological agriculture going on? So this is where I was coming from at the time. Uh, once again, I mentioned that I hated my job, and I saw an ad in a magazine it said that the homestead laws in Alaska were closing forever. So this is the final approach by road to uh, where um, my homestead property is. still have the property up in, up in the Mentasta Mountains of Alaska. At the time, it was about six hours northeast of Anchorage. Uh, it's on the northwestern corner of Wrangell St. Elias National Park. And we could drive up to right about this close here. And this is the mountain. We're on the other side of that mountain. So you kind of go up this riverbed. You can go around this way. You go over the pass that way. 
So I'll show you what it looked like. This is where I cut my teeth on how do we survive in our place without screwing it up. Oops, I went backwards. So you go up around the face of this mountain, you kind of go up this creek over here, and you kind of go up that way, and then you go around the corner. Uh, <clears throat> this is these are mountains on the right. Don't fall down there, you might get hurt. Uh, then you'd stop off here, get a little bit of water, usually uh, get out your binoculars and look for grizzlies because there's quite often up in these hill, hills lots of grizzly bears wandering around. Then we continue walking to the left into this valley through the pass, then you come down to so Slicitna Creek and then into the homestead area which kind of started right about where the, um, where the shadow line is, down the creek and then up this mountain. Uh, the homestead, uh, my particular cabin was at 3,500 feet up on the side of the mountain and if you walked in a straight line Along this view, it's a 300-mile path <clears throat> direct to the Pacific Ocean, across the uh, second largest ice field in, in North America, the Bagley Ice Field. The clouds you see here are the Nebesna Glacier, which is the largest terrestrial glacier uh, in Alaska. It's over 70, 80 miles long. And here I am in this beautiful place, this beautiful paradise, and trying to figure out how to survive. And I'm watching my neighbor. Look at this little peninsula down here. Notice how there's just a little few trees around the edge of it, and there aren't any in the middle. Well, this guy moves out with his family, and they moved on a peninsula that was mostly spruce like this, white spruce. So they began to clear it, to build their house, to cut for firewood, and then to clear the land because in order to homestead, you have to clear the land in order to grow your food. So they grazed a bunch of goats, had a bunch of sheep, um, a couple of pigs, a small garden, and basically... Uh, eradicated the entire ecosystem where they lived in order to scratch up the ground, to have it wash away in the rain, to blow away in the wind, to grow a handful of seeds. What? It was crazy. It seemed crazy to me. I got to see in a small scale what cultures have done on a large scale planet wide. All cultures everywhere who have uh, relied on annual crops, that's corn, uh, beans, rice, wheat, lentils, peas, etc. All cultures that have depended on annual grains as their staple food crops, which are their carbohydrates, proteins, and oils, they've all ended in a collapse. Do your homework. While I was up there, <clears throat> I started writing a book, uh, explained a whole bunch of different principles. I brought it to a friend of mine, the next ridge over. He actually, uh, he actually lived over on this ridge here, in that little pocket. You can see a little shadow there. Uh, I said, hey, Michael, what do you think about this book? He said, wow, they've already written it. It's called Permaculture. So this is a photograph of my uh, first edition hardcover permaculture designer's manual. And in the back of the original hardcover uh, designer's manual was the names and addresses of all those people who had trained in a permaculture design to date. <clears throat> of course, permaculture founded by Bill Mollison. Um, rest in peace, Bill. Thank you so much for your gift to the universe. Uh, I first heard him say this particular paragraph here, and literally it changed my life especially this white, this white sentence right here, that the aim of permaculture, a contraction between the word permanent and agriculture, back when I was trained, the aim is to create systems that are ecologically sound and economically profitable. And that seems to me like a home run for human activities on the planet because if, uh, if we can create systems that are ecologically sound, we can't screw up. If they're economically profitable, that means we get to pay our bills, we get to have a surplus, you know, to share, exchange, etc. Um, I like it also because it's based on an ethic, and even though it's a, an ethic that we all think, yeah, care of the earth and care of people in some sort of equitable system exchange, return the surplus, fair share, whatever, we can't even agree what the three ethics are. That's what I love about ethics, is they kind of give us a guideline, but the details are up to us to figure out within the context of our own lives, our own places, our own cultures, our own religions, our own political systems, these ethics are for us to continually work with, wrestle with, and unfold for real in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, and that's what I love about permaculture. Instead of it being a cookie-cutter recipe saying, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that, it's just like organic. It's this list of what to do and what not to do, and, and it's, uh, it's become a shadow of what it could be. Whereas an ethic like this is constantly being updated, constantly being changed, and we're constantly having the conversation about what does it mean to actually care for the earth, to care for people, and to have this third ethic. What actually is the third ethic? <clears throat> Love it. <clears throat> Some of the uh, permaculture principles from Mollison, I read them, and I said, oh, okay, if this is what permaculture is, that means we observe and imitate nature. 
then we interact with it and accept feedback. And uh, in the 30 years since I first heard um, about permaculture, over and over and over again, I, I, I look around me and I see permaculturists who are missing the whole first point here, failing to observe nature and imitate it, and then failing to interact with it. They like, well, might do something and then look at it at a distance or talk about it or, or wish or hope instead of interacting with it and changing along with it. We work with nature rather than fight against it, uh, understand natural succession, create integrated cyclical systems, et cetera. What this means to me, what it meant to me when I first heard this and read this, was we are to become students of nature, <clears throat> intense students of nature, and understand it more than any other demographic on the planet because we are here to create a new system, a new human culture that is actually a part of our ecosystem, a part of our planet, not a imposition on it. <clears throat> I really feel strongly about that, and, and I've been living my life that way and would like to encourage you guys to do the same. Uh, in the Permaculture Designer's Manual, I heard about this book right here, uh, Water for Every Farm uh, by P.A. Yeomans, edited by his son Ken, that described a method of uh, uh, water management on farm properties uh, that I thought was pretty cool, but even more significant than the water management techniques, which, you know, as I'll explain, the, the, the key line techniques, believe it or not, are actually quite limited to very specific landforms. And if you're on at all a complex or complicated landform, the key line cultivation pattern just won't work the way the book says it will because your system, your, your land is actually shaped a little bit too complex for it. However, what is absolutely key <laughs> from the whole key line design thing is this, this scale of permanence. When we're uh, going to do any kind of development on the ground, whether it's at your homestead, your suburban lot, a piece of farm property, piece of rural natural resource property, or a development for uh, multiple households and families, uh, this, this um, key line scale of permanence is really helpful. We, we start with the things that we have the least immediate control over, such as the climate. Climate, what we're going to have to do with each one of these things, we either uh, mitigate it, change it, we ad adapt to it, or we mitigate the pluses and minuses of it. So climate, we're going to have to like adapt to it and mitigate a little bit. We can't directly change the climate uh, immediately by turning a switch. The land shape, unless you're going to do mountaintop removal of your place, uh, we're not really going to change the fact that some people have steep land. Um, this is for Sioux in, um, in uh, New Zealand. Other people have flatter land or, or steep landscapes, deep landscapes, shallow landscapes. Uh, we're not going to do a lot with the land shape. Now water, however, we can have quite a bit of influence on in how the water interacts with our land shape, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we, uh, the roads, once we put them in place, we don't want to uh, do anything to change those. It's quite an investment in infrastructure. Our trees uh, will follow the patterns that we put on our landscape buildings and so on, how we divide it up with fields and or additional lots for housing and so on. What I liked about this was that it put soil last. As a student of nature, I've seen trees uh, growing out of cliffs. You probably have too. I've seen a, a, a parking lot being taken over by mosses and grasses and eventually raspberries. I've seen raspberries in the crack uh, of an attorney's uh, sidewalk. Uh, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, they go 50 feet out the sidewalk. They take a right and go down the sidewalk till they get to the road, and they go under the curb, and then they come up in the cracks in the road all the way out to the middle of the road. And these little teeny tiny miniature bonsai raspberries. Uh, where's the soil in a road? Where's the soil in the crack in a, in a sidewalk? There isn't any. Plants don't really need soil all that much. Uh, sure, it helps them to grow faster and all that kind of stuff. In nature, the biological community actually creates the soil. And so what we're going to do in a, in a restoration agriculture system is we are going to create the soil using the biological systems. That's how nature rolls. <clears throat> Through a long story I don't really have time for here, but it involved recreational ethanol in a sauna at 2 o'clock in the morning and an agreement scratched on a sweaty napkin uh, between three different guys went in on a piece of property, degraded farm property in southwest Wisconsin. It was all uh, overgrazed pasture or abandoned crop field, corn and bean stubble. Uh, there were less than an acre and a half, two acres of, of uh, trees on the site, and they were all 
just little saplings, inch and a half, two inch diameter, the most grown up thick, uh, like, you know, hair on the back of a dog. And this is our, our home right now, obviously the picture taken in the springtime. Uh, it's the whole permaculture thing, built into the hillside, off grid, uses local materials, the logs, you know, were from right down the road. Uh, wind and solar, electricity, solar heat and hot water, water from the roof, all the bells and whistles that a, that a, a permaculture homestead. We began construction in 1985, and uh, if you ever want to know why they call them buildings, is because they're never built. If they were, if you ever read a book by the owner built home, ha ha ha, I would not trust that all the way because it should be the owner building home, always being built, always making additions to it. So 20 years into the into the program, I got tired of trying to explain to people that what I was doing was permaculture. This is permanent agriculture. I'm, I'm using design principles right out of the book. Why does it look so different than everybody else? So I wrote this book called Restoration Agriculture. If you haven't read it, highly recommended going to Acres USA down here at the bottom, uh, ordering the book. And it won three literary awards last year, which kind of surprised me because if I ever tried to write a book to win literary awards, I don't think I could. Uh, part of, I think, what, uh, what won the awards was the fact that it, it's so doggone simple. It's really, really, really simple and refreshing to a certain extent. And it's only written at about a sixth grade reading level because that's about all I can write at. <clears throat> so I took it real seriously. That if we're, if we're going to observe and imitate nature and interact with it and accept feedback, we let a better learn about how nature works. So if we're going to work with nature and understand natural succession, we have to know how it works. Uh, part of how it works is there are certain characteristics, and this is almost parallel with, uh, with uh, Yeoman's scale of permanence, is that we've got our regional climate with the physiography, the general shape of the land and all that, and the general vegetation patterns in a region, we can't really change that. So that's a place where we better adapt to it. Maybe we can mitigate a little bit. Then our local climate within that region, uh, once again, we're not really going to change how the clouds move and the rainfall patterns and all that. We're going to somehow adapt to it. This is, this is uh, what's called a successional filter in, in ecology, is that this right here, will determine what species you use, period. And so uh, what restoration agriculture is all about is what are the successional filters to your area? What are the, the, the suite of species, S-U-I-T-E, that naturally grow there, would grow there, are naturalized there, and what types of plant communities do they form? They actually live in these natural associations with one another over and over and over across the planet, and that's what we work with. Instead of coming into an area and going, oh, gee whiz, I think I'll plant a guild of and we impose something on the landscape, although it might be permaculture, it's using a lot of perennials, it might be a food forest and all that stuff, it's totally out of context because it really doesn't have anything to do with the actual place where we live and the species that have been here for zillions of years. Disturbance uh, uh, is, a is, a, is a fact of life uh, on the planet. It's totally natural. Uh, it creates, it changes the species composition of the site, and it makes new uh, growing sites available for new propagules coming in from somewhere. <clears throat> These different disturbances can be fire or wind, landslide, earthquake, volcano, uh, floods, deposition, and so on and so on. And what's interesting is then how do these different species that were determined a lot by the climate interact with, these are all interactive here, so how do the different species near us interact with the disturbance regime, the types of disturbances, how frequently disturbances happen, um, how do the different species get in there? Are they sexually reproduced, asexually reproduced, they send underground runners, little light seeds that blow in the wind, uh, heavy seeds that are carried by an animal and buried, seeds or fruits that are eaten by an animal and pooped out somewhere else. And then once those species have found their new home in this new disturbed site, how do they grow? <clears throat> do they grow real fast? Do they grow slow at first? Then later, are they, are they uh, very competitive with other plants? Do they live uh, in uh, kind of collaboration with other plants? Are they mutually supportive of, of one another? How do they deal with environmental stresses? Do they put out uh, poisonous chemicals to other plants? And so on and so on. All these different things now will tell us how our individual plant communities behave. So this right here, to me, is a, a basically a permaculturist's um, a, a, a refinement of the key line um, scale of permanence. <clears throat> so what restoration agriculture is, in short, 
is agricultural biomimicry. We're going to design systems to provide our staple food crops, our carbohydrates, proteins, and oils in systems that imitate nature. Uh, they're going to be a lot more uh, uh, specific than just a generic uh, you know, permaculture plot down somewhere that somebody got out of a book somewhere or saw on a, on a webinar. Oh, wait a minute, I can't say that. This is a webinar. <clears throat> so in, in my book, Restoration Agriculture, I, I talk about this little protocol, which also parallels the, the, um, the key line scale of permanence, is we identify our biome. Where do we live? What are the species that grow here, that thrive here with what I call sheer total utter neglect? Because if you look at nature, it has never spent one penny uh, replicating itself and spreading to cover as much of the earth that's not frozen <clears throat> and or totally bone dry. And it's even working on the places that are totally frozen and totally bone dry. <clears throat> Nobody's doing anything uh, for the most part to help it do that. It does it all by itself. That's the effortlessness that I want to have my agriculture operate under. I want to be able to do nothing to it except go in and harvest yields, harvest yields, and by harvesting yields, I'm taking care of that system. We want to do some earthworks to manage our water, uh, move the water where we want it to, where it's most useful for us. After all, we're designing human systems here. We're designing our own human habitat, and there's nothing wrong about us interacting consciously with our habitat, because we human beings are changing our habitat, whether we're conscious of it or not. I want to be as conscious of it as I can, and I want to help to optimize function and yield within a system. So once we've set up the earthworks and water management, it makes a pattern on the land. We're going to do edible woody polycultures. This picture right here is a woody polyculture. Uh, perennial plants uh, galore that are all part of a plant community. You'll see later on which ones they are. All of the fences, roads, utilities, pipelines all follow the water management pattern. The uh, edible woody polycultures all follow that pattern. And then we use the agroforestry techniques in order to cash flow through the years, so we have yields right off the bat from year one, and we continue to have yields throughout uh, throughout the whole succession of, of the uh, of the property. And the successional filters. What are the successional filters where you live? Currently, Neil is in a place where there's not a lot of water that falls from the sky, so that's going to be a serious filter. Anything that cannot survive extreme long periods of drought will not survive. So don't even try. Let's start now with the, the gene pool of the plants and the animals that are adapted to that. Now let's work within that pool and start to do some accelerated breeding to push it in the direction that we want, manage the water resource, and so on. We need to understand the ecology of our place. <clears throat> How do you do that? Well, there's a lot of textbooks back in the day, 20 years ago. That's what we had were books. Now there's a zillion resources online. Go online, learn about your natural plant communities, uh, of the place where you live. Now, of course, we're not going to be doing a purist ecological restoration. We're not going to just go out and make a natural plant community and stand back and watch it happen. We're going to go in and look at the species list in this book, for example, and cherry pick the ones that will provide us with our staple foods, our carbohydrates, proteins, and oils, extra high vitamins and minerals, uh, extra medicinal qualities, certain utilitarian qualities, be it fiber for you know making boards or or, or cords uh, and so on so do your homework and um, start to imitate the place where you're at one of the more widespread uh, um, plant communities around the world actually in the temperate regions happens to be uh, uh, around it's it's uh, associated with the oak now um, oaks are fire adapted species. They're accustomed to regular fire going through and burning out the understory. They live in grasslands with grass. They live on dry sites, wet sites, uh, uh, Mediterranean climates, monsoon climates, uh, super humid climates. They're an amazingly adapted species. Uh, they have uh, a gigantic seed in common. Now it's the, it's the dominant uh, longest lived uh, and the largest species within a plant community that tends to drive the rest of the plant community chemically. It's exuding things into the ground that unless you, you're happy with an oak, you won't live with an oak. Um, and also it's the leaf litter, it's decomposing, there's a certain amount of decomposer organisms that are all focused around the oaks. Oak is a phagaceae, there's oak, chestnut, or beech are all in the same um, family. Uh, they all three of them have rather large nuts. I picked chestnut because of its regular bearing habit. 
uh, and I'm not too far out of the range where chestnut was natural and native to North America. So my idea in southwest Wisconsin was to set up an oak savanna mimic. We're going to use these keystone species as our economic food fuel medicine fiber species, understory of apples or haws. Um, instead of using the wild crab apple with small bitter fruit, I'll go ahead and I'll use uh, domestic varieties, a wide spectrum of varieties because, and then I, and, and then treat them with zero care. I want to let all the pests and all the diseases go at them. And if you are uh, resistant to a disease and resistant to pests, I want you. I grab, grab your branch, graft you onto other roots of apples. Pretty soon we have a pest and disease resistant um, apple system. I won't call it an orchard because it does not look like what you think an orchard would. And um, at, over time, as these particular varieties now become susceptible to these newly adapted pests and diseases that come in, we're constantly planting seed. We're using a lot of seedling from our selected material to get the next generations of the pest and disease resistant plants uh, in our system. The dominant shrub in the oak uh, family were hazelnuts, and if anybody has any question about what to do with hazelnuts, uh, maybe we should have a special webinar session just for you. Um, the prunuses are the plums, cherries, peach, almonds, apricots. They're a the natural part of the system. Raspberries, grapes, currants, uh, blackberries are also thrown in there, gooseberries. There's fungi decomposing all the organic matter from leaves to uh, stems to, to uh, roots. There's mycorrhizal fungi. There's grass decomposing fungi. So there's a whole group of, of useful fungus as part of the system. We have forage all around, all kinds of plants, and then animals. The, the biology, the above ground terrestrial biology of planet Earth has co-adapted, evolved, or was co-created with mammals for the last epoch, two, two different epochs, the Pleistocene, Holocene. This has been all about mammals interacting with their environment. Even if you don't eat mammals, or there are certain mammals that you don't eat, you will have mammals as part of your system, and so you might as well use them as a tool. So does anybody see on this particular list of species anything that's an annual plant that you have to destroy an ecosystem, plow the ground, put your seeds in the ground, or start your seeds in a, in a greenhouse and baby them for a while, put them in with a deep mulch bed? No, you set the system up and you turn it loose and you let it figure itself out. They're all, they all belong with one another. They're all adapted to be with one another. And you manage it by mimicking its natural disturbance pattern, which in this case is primarily fire and grazing. The Juglandaceae are walnuts, and this uh, green right here is the natural range of black walnut. Walnut doesn't kill everything underneath it. It's selective about what it poisons with its juglones. Uh, cherries grow perfectly well with it, raspberries, blackberries, elderberries, currants, gooseberries, grapes, fungi forage. Once again, this is a, a, a perennial uh, a food ecosystem that we can harvest these things from and sell them to pay our bills. Pecan is also a juglones. Um, just further south, it's warmer climate that it prefers. Persimmons and pawpaws can be thrown in the mix. Passion fruit can be thrown in the mix as well as a nice little vine crawling all over it. Um, you guys will be able to get the recording of this later on, I assume, and so that's why I'm flying through this. If you want to have all these written down, you just kind of look at the uh, recording later on. Um, persimmons, pawpaw, blackberries, elderberries, gooseberries. It, does anybody have any questions about you know, why on earth are we trying to invent guilds of plants that live with one another when we're surrounded by natural communities of plants that have been living together for one, with one another for as long as they've been together? And the most widespread on the planet goes all the way from the poles uh, either side is are, are the plant community that, that surrounds the pine, and these are the pine nuts. Obviously, some pines have bigger nuts than the other ones, and if that's what we want to have as part of our system, that's what we'll plant. Beech is usually uh, is, is, uh, also on the farther north, farther south side, very closely associated with the pines. Uh, I threw in serviceberry, juneberries, saskatoons for some people, uh, Siberian peach shrub, carragana arborescens. Uh, it's non-native, and it's actually uh, rather aggressive. It's illegal to plant in some places. I know Saskatchewan, it's illegal to plant. Blackberries, blueberries, lingonberries, cranberries. Uh, all of these grow in natural association with one another. So at New Forest Farm, we pick primarily the oak uh, plant family, plant community, and we also uh, settled in on the pines. 
the uh, oak oak plant community is basically everywhere. And here, there's a small grouping of the pine, and here's a small grouping, you know, small grouping, 20 acres or so over here, another five acres over there. So the first step, we now know the plant communities that we're going to work with. Let's manage our water resource with the appropriate ecosystem disturbance. Nature is managed and, and operated by disturbance, periodic disturbance. Some of it happens more frequently. Some of it happens less frequently. Some of it happens on a large area, like a volcanic eruption that wipes out hundreds of square miles. Others happen in a small area, like a rodent hole with a little bit of dirt that covers something else. Uh, disturbance is a natural part of uh, nature's economy, and we want to imitate that as best as possible. This is what our water did before we um, use what we're calling master line patterning, which is um, you know born out of key line design. And uh, what it is is, is we're going to use structures that very closely mimic pit and mound microtopography. The most common disturbance worldwide, micro disturbance worldwide, is called pit and mound microtopography. Wind blows a tree over, or the ground gets so wet and the tree gets so old it falls over. The root ball rips up. Now you have this uh, mixing of organic matter. You have roots, the woody debris, leaves mixed with the mineral soil. Rocks get thrown in there as well. Then there's a pit, a depression over here. And notice the exposed mineral soil. Exposed mineral soil is natural and normal in the economy of nature. However, it's not natural and normal to take 40% of the Earth's surface, like uh, we have right now with annual agriculture, and have it be bare black dirt for uh, the majority of the year. That's not normal. But to imitate disturbance and to have periodically, episodically exposed mineral soil and to mix the topsoil with the subsoil is natural and normal. And we can use that to start the establishment of new plants. And I took this picture, and if I was wearing my glasses, which I'm not right now because I broke them, uh, right down here, you can see a little green acorn that's fallen to the pit here. This is the home of a new oak tree. This is totally a natural blowdown. So we're going to imitate pit and mound microtopography to uh, create new sites for establishing plants and to manage the water. Notice how it's sh more shady here. It's moister down on the bottom. It's going to collect leaves. It's, that's going to collect organic matter. It's going to start to decompose. There's going to be a micro compost pile going on here. The, the woody material mixed with the topsoil here, it's all going to settle, uh, settle down and be a much richer soil. This actually enriches the soil because you're concentrating water, compost, decomposer organisms, uh, and you get new, new species established. This is just a design of a system that we did in Virginia. We're going to connect all these uh, pit and mound structures by using a tool. Uh, we can use a bulldozer, if that's one of the things that you have at your, at your disposal, to make, here we've got a swale on the right and then the berm. Uh, the, the cut in the swale is below grade, the natural level of the ground, so it actually holds the water as the ground itself, not the mound. The mound is just where the extra debris goes, and they're all pitched in a particular direction to move the water where you want it to. Your goals on your property uh, will be the determining factor of where you make the water go. Uh, that's the short and long of it. And if you look at this line across here, if you can see my cursor going that way, that line right there goes from high in a valley over on the left, lower downhill, it's going downhill at a 1% slope out to the ridge where it's going to make a level sill and sheet across the ridge. It's the optical illusion uh, that this is going downhill, but the ridge is going downhill at a steeper angle. You see all these different angles of the tree line and the field line. If you have a one bottom plow, two bottom plow, just a simple uh, ditch in a mound, pit and mound microtopography. Here's an example where we use a bulldozer again. It's uh, scraped down to the mineral soil, just like when the tree fell over. All the roots of the trees are all mixed in with, with, that, uh, with this debris. The water now collects at the bottom. This is a moister site. It has the opportunity to soak, soak in. Our, our goal here is to capture the water, slow it down, spread it out, and soak it in. However, our goals might be different. Let's pretend I'm in Saudi Arabia for a moment. We don't get very much rain at all. Maybe our goals are not to slow the water down and, and spread it out and soak it in. Maybe the, the goals in that situation would be to concentrate it at specific spots. Now we have an area with more effective rainfall than the natural three or four inches that might fall in the course of a year. We can take a wider area, move it to a spot, and then we can be growing things that require a lot more water. And we will be using more water 
uh, in very specific places because we're going to be really packing the, the biology in there. So this is the, what the water movement looks like on New Forest Farm after the master line patterning and terraces and ponds. First phase of, of after any disturbance in nature happens to be stand initiation. It happens faster or slower. Slower in areas that are extreme, extremely hot, extremely cold, extremely wet, or extremely dry. It's also slower when there is a shortage of uh, propagules coming in, seed or runners or plant parts coming in from the outside. Uh, so the further you are away from an intact ecosystem anywhere, the slower your place will recover. And I used Saudi Arabia already. Because of the aridity and the heat of Saudi Arabia, that's going to be very slow to be established. You can be in the stand initiation establishment phase for years and years and years and years and years uh, before you get later on to an exclusion, stem exclusion phase. Stand initiation phase, for us, if we're moving into old abandoned agricultural land uh, or rescued agricultural land, we're planting trees. Not just, uh, uh, not just any old trees. We're going to be planting trees, shrubs, bushes, and vines, and canes that are all related to one another in their natural plant community. We may be picking selected cultivars within those groups. And we're going to plant them uh, higher density. Uh, and we're going to rely a lot on seedling material. These are chestnut trees, which uh, universities recommend you plant them 30 feet apart. These buggers are three feet apart. Why do we do that? We want to have more total numbers because we want to roll the genetic dice and have the winners that are in there. And these aren't all grafted cultivars. I was just looking up pecans the other day for a client. We can get grafted pecan trees uh, 18 inches to 24 inches tall for $28 a piece. Or we can get seedling material for $3 a piece. Now, if you're going to plant you know, all, all uh, grafted, guaranteed genetics, they all ripen at the same time, predictable qualities, all that kind of stuff, it's going to cost you a fortune compared to what seedlings will. Well, seedlings, they're not all going to be predictable like a grafted plant would. However, we've got all kinds of other ways to use them. It's not just going to be chestnuts coming out of here. It's going to be chestnuts, apples, hazelnuts, grapes, raspberries, currants, gooseberries, mushrooms, grazing, and not just one type of animal, but several kinds of animals. Now we're going to imitate another type of uh, natural disturbance. We're going to imitate some of the micro effects of uh, small animals, tunneling rodents, moles, voles, ground squirrels. Notice how the grass is all knocked down, and then it's gone down in the hole here. Uh, there's all these channels been dug into the soil by small animals, and some of the uh, material uh, washes out, and it now covers some, some other place. Uh, we're going to imitate that, all these different tunnels in the ground. When it rains, obviously the water's going into those tunnels. We're going to use a subsoiler. Uh, here's a subsoiler on New Forest Farm. Notice this is a, uh, an alley in between rows of trees. And we're cutting these slots to allow roots to grow faster, allow the water to penetrate, get some air down in there. And the results of when you do this on a, on a perennial uh, landscape is pretty phenomenal. So here's this particular example of how we did it. If you look how the sh shape of the land was, that's what the water used to do. Well, once we put this patterning in place, the fields are now arranged that way. We have swales and berms and an alley and a swale and a berm and an alley and so on. Then we follow those alleys using a subsoiler. Now the water doesn't go this way anymore. It goes this way, We're spreading that water out, soaking it in. So instead of having 20 inches of rain fall on the site in the course of the year and all flow away, except for one or two inches it manages to soak in, we want all 20 inches of that. We're going to soak it all in. This is a ridge form uh, on New Forest Farm. And you can see, obviously, there's puddling going on over here. The water would have, before we shaped it, alley, swale, berm, trees alley, swale, berm, trees. That's how we've chosen to do it. You might do alley, uh, you might do swale with trees in the bottom, berm with trees on the top, you know, trees below the berm, depending on your site conditions, and we won't get into that now. But this is the way the water used to move before we did the land shaping. That's the way the water moves now. Uh, I want that water. The wettest places on my farm now are on the ridges. I kid you not. Now we cash flow using the agroforestry techniques. Trees are in the ground. High density, we have lots of genetic material to choose from. The water is managed. It's spreading out over the whole landscape. Now we get a cash flow. Now we are actually using some annual crops. We're growing produce crops in between. Uh, we grow small grains in between. And I had already mentioned that 
that it's the natural plant communities that create the soil. We're going to use annual plants the way they're used in nature. They're the first ones to colonize a disturbed site. They grow like crazy, have a tremendous amount of biomass, and we're going to uh, let them rot right on the spot. We're going to graze them. We're going to harvest the seeds. We're going to graze them, uh, and then we're going to let them decay right on the spot. This is not just a, a wheat field. This is wheat that's been undersown with uh, clovers. And you see down in here, where's my cursor? Right down in here. You can see some of the clovers starting to peak up. Uh, yeah, there's an annual crop here. Yes, this was bare soil a year ago, but now it's growing. It's totally covered. There's no exposed soil. And um, keep going. All right, I got a screen freeze. There we go. And then we have the yellow sweet clover which grows up within the wheat. So now we have wheat as a grain, yellow sweet clover, which is a legume putting 95 pounds of uh, nitrogen per acre into the soil. The biomass is, uh, with this system of the sweet clover and the, and the wheat or the rye is about 20,000 pounds of organic matter per acre that's rotting right in place. Uh, you get about 100 uh, pounds. It's 10 gallons of honey per acre of yellow sweet clover. So there's another yield we're getting out of the system. And then we ha end up with this big, huge, four to six inches of mulch on top of the soil and look what the soil does underneath. Nice dark black topsoil. That's not the way our topsoil looked like 20 years ago. It looked like this. It was red clay topsoil. And in 20 years, using the water management, land shaping, and the techniques I just showed you, by farming it, by actually farming it, and by actually tilling, we created black topsoil from red clay that used to stick to your boots. This is just a, an example of one of our squash fields again. So then what do you do with all the clover uh, after it re-sprouts the next year? That's our biggest weed problem. Oh, that's terrible. We have a nitrogen-fixing crop as a, as a weed problem. Then we plant our squash. And if you're getting 35,000 pounds per acre of uh, winter squash, even at 10 cents a pound, this $3,000 an acre. Uh, produce can be a really uh, high-value way to, um, uh, to, to cash flow your farm by using the alleys as your trees mature. See some of the trees in the, in the row? You can't even see them hardly, but there they are, wide spaced alleys. All of our produce has gone wholesale. We're a member of a wholesale produce wholesale co-op, the Organic Valley Cooperative. There's an acorn squash field. You've seen that on the advertisement for this webinar. Uh, here's, a, here's a field in rotation. This is uh, small grains about to grow up. This is a, uh, asparagus, and these are chestnuts with raspberries in the row. And so the idea here is that eventually this was going to be entirely chestnuts. And so we started by cash flowing with annual produce. Well, then at some point in time, you've got both. You've got both produce and chestnuts coming off the same site. We didn't get declining yields. We got more yields by having more, more plants available to harvest. And, and asparagus, what a fabulous crop. Um, you know, it's perennial. One person, it'll take about uh, six hours a day to harvest two acres of asparagus, six weeks in the spring, two acres of asparagus per motivated person. Uh, it's a great, uh, great cash crop for those of you that can grow it. More asparagus between a chestnut rose. In the previous uh, slide you saw right there, you see that little fence line going through. That's the fence for our next phase, of course, because we include animals in the mix. 100% of our 110 acres is uh, grazed at some point in time uh, during the course of a year. This is a field of sunflowers. Sunflowers produce 140 gallons of vegetable oil per acre. After they're pressed out, the meal is a high protein meal. It's great as an animal feed or as a human feed. The oil can be used directly to run a, a converted diesel engine. Our tractor has been uh, adapted to run on straight vegetable oil. I'm part of a vegetable oil cooperative. Another uh, economic opportunity is to collaborate with others and buy the basic infrastructure that you can't afford alone and get into the business of, for example, making vegetable oil for sale for others. As the system matures and closes in, you might want to switch. Instead of growing annual crops in between anymore, now you're starting to get too closed in. Let's, uh, let's fill in with other perennial, useful perennial plants, and in this case, elderberries and mulberries and grapes and raspberries and grass, and let's start grazing it. This is not the same abandoned cornfield that you saw, you know, umpteen years ago. These are chestnuts in full bloom. Those of you who have not seen chestnuts in full bloom, it's quite a sight to behold. The bees and the chestnuts are just amazing. We've got pigs uh, running about. That's part of our system. Uh, every year for 20 years, we've had at least cattle and hogs. Sometimes we've had sheep. Sometimes we've had turkeys. Always had chickens as well. Uh, guineas for the past, you know, six or seven years or so. 
Uh, they don't require much of a fence to keep them in. We put rings in their noses so they don't plow up the ground, and they graze. They're very effective grazers. If they start eating fruit out of this system here when the currants are ready in June, then the raspberries and the mulberries. The mulberries are really good to like from middle of June to almost September. And the cherries start falling for them, and apples and hazelnuts, and they finish on chestnuts. And when the chestnuts are done, they go to uh, the freezer. And notice this pig right here, he's, he's rustling chestnuts, falling chestnuts out of a swale and a berm. Whichever ones that I don't pick up, so this is a timing issue. You don't move the animals in until after we've harvested the stuff for human food, then they go in and clean up afterwards. Now, one of the things about, about uh, the system that, that we're growing, it's not a food forest. The food forest is an idea that we've imposed on something. It's a cute, rolls off the tongue, it's a cute name and all that. Um, we like to keep our system in this middle phase for a couple different reasons. It's just come out of early succession. The trees are really starting to get established. The speed at which trees grow is fastest right in like these middle teenage, rel you know, relatively speaking, teenage for a tree years. You don't get the fastest growth out of an old growth system. You don't get the fastest growth out of a young system just getting established. Your fastest growth happens right in here. We want the hyperactive growth, the fastest growing uh, age class of trees is right in that, that band right there. Well, it also happens that we still have grass from the earlier phases that's here. It's not closed the canopy and gotten rid of the grass yet, which over here you have no grasses in there. And the grasses are important for our, for our livestock and also the open areas is important for our yields, for our produce yields. So we want to stay right in that band, right about in there, so we have rapid, rapid tree growth uh, and uh, productivity from other parts of the system. Here's pigs later on. Yeah, these are all taken through the years, so you can see the difference in the size of the trees as they've grown. Um, different species of pigs, the different uh, breeds of pigs. Uh, we've been told over and over again that we can't get yields with such a highly competitive system. Well, it's not all that, uh, not all that much competition going on in there. And what do you think the pigs are adding uh, to the ground here? They're doing some weed control. They're grazing the dickens out of the the uh, grass underneath. They haven't rooted it up. They just ripped it off at ground level. They're urinating and they're pooping all over the place and they're fertilizing uh, the dickens out of these trees. And, they, and the trees also don't have as much competition in the understory uh, and they seem to thrive. All sites, once they're colonized by plants, uh, the plants grow and then at a certain point in time there, there could be no more plants will fit in there and the plants start to compete with one another uh, and exclude one another and stems start to die. What's also happened here is we notice that the grasses have start to die. Well the grasses are important to me, that's feeding the, the cattle and the hogs. And so I'm going to start to remove trees instead of letting them die on their own. Now I'm going to start to remove trees. So uh, this, was take, uh, this was taken just a few days ago but last winter, late last winter, removed a whole bunch of trees, uh, used the uh, butt logs for inoculating in the mushrooms, you'll see later on, the medium-sized ones became firewood, and then the others I dropped on the ground and then chipped them with a flail chopper. Notice the light penetration that's happened, and notice how the grass has responded over here. Not much grass under here. Tremendous amount of grass over here. This has been grazed by the cattle, I think, three different times this summer. No pigs in there this year. So the yields I got out of this system after ignoring it um, for years, ignored it by having cattle graze through it, yields I got were mushroom logs, firewood, and, um, and cattle grazing. And the cattle, of course, are doing the fertilizer on that. And if I got, you know, two to four pounds a day of, of uh, beef gain per animal, that's, that's a home run. That's how to interact with the site at a yield instead of as, as an expense. If I was just managing a chestnut orchard, when you go into a chestnut orchard and do anything except harvest chestnuts, it's costing you money, it's costing you time. This way, I want every entry into the site to be somewhat of a profitable uh, venture for me, whether it's just firewood alone. Then we go through with the flail chopper and chip it all up, um, and then this stuff is just going to decompose on the ground. Why should I haul it away, then chip it, then make compost piles, then load it up on another piece of equipment to bring back and spread on the ground, let it rot right in place, and we have helpers to let it rot right in place. We'll see that pretty soon. Once you've let in some more light, now there's this understory reinitiation phase. Any seeds that may have been buried down in here, plus the stumps of any of the trees that are, that are of species that like the coppice, they're going to immediately grow back. This is my next generation of trees. I'm now in a permanent 
a permanent state where I can do this forever, always having yields. I can always be grazing animals, always be harvesting chestnuts, always be harvesting raspberries, elderberries, blackberries, currants, gooseberries, uh, and we'll see pretty soon mushrooms. Oh my goodness, the mushrooms that we eat. Shiitakes on the left, on chestnut, lion's mane on the right, on maple, uh, chicken of the woods on a hickory. I didn't think it would grow on hickory, and then wine cap strafaria. All these mulch, all of the uh, chip stuff right here. When I go out before I chip it, I just scatter some sawdust strafaria spawn all over the place, and you just harvest the bounty later. How much work did it involve setting it all up? This is all very low maintenance, low key. I'm not really trying to get any part of the system to perform hyperactively. I'm trying to set up a system that functions easily all by itself, and I just go harvest the surplus, eat it or sell it, and end up with a place that looks like this. Trees are growing really, really fast. Uh, this is a, a, sh a slide I showed for the first time last night. The right-hand side of the road, this was 21, 21 years ago, I planted uh, spruce trees, so you see one spruce tree here, and maple in, in this side, of the, on the right-hand side of the road. Uh, there's chestnut in here, there's all kinds of stuff. Well, then what I did is on the right, I did nothing to it. No management maintenance to it at all, just let it go wild. On the left, within years, a couple of years, I started to, to cut things with pruners and favoring the trees that I wanted to grow the fastest. So the place on the left has had at least between one and five tons of wood harvested from it every single year for almost 20 years, and there's more trees there, there's more wood there than there is on the right where I just planted it and walked away and did nothing to it. By managing our ecosystem, by working with it, we will get increased productivity. Our cattle, we're mob stock grazing. Our cattle on our system eat the grass. It's just amazing that you can buy a you know a 500 pound animal in the spring and it weighs a thousand pounds in the fall. It's like you know free meat. All they're doing is mowing my grass and pooping on my trees. 72 cow patties a day and 35 gallons of urine per cow. Wow! What if you were to go out and buy that fertilizer? Um, this this is a black walnut stand on the farm, entirely managed by animals. This site here has never had any kind of machine management in there whatsoever. It's only cattle and pigs that have been doing that. It's the cattle and the walnuts. Uh, when you are grazing animals in with your trees, they will not be re-sprouting as, as uh, readily as if they didn't have the uh, grazing animals in there. And so we will be planting trees in the holes. And so this, these are uh, uh, oak trees that we uh, poke, poked, in, uh, poked in the pockets, popped in the pockets. Uh, where there's a large gap between trees, just to make sure that we we'll always have that next generation of trees growing. And uh, here's just shows example. We're not excluding the cattle from the trees, even when they're really young. We're putting them right in there, and you're going to get cattle browsing on the trees. These are cattle in the high density chestnuts, um, happy as can be. They're mostly interested in eating grass. That's what they're designed for. And this is a, a space where they've just gone through, they've grazed all the grass, and they have done some browse damage. You see they've broken branches and eaten some of these leaves, but you observe, and as soon as they start really hammering these trees, because they've eaten all the good grass, then it's time to move them. And then that way we've got the tree that's been weeded around, it's been fertilized next to, there's about a 50% graze, 50% trample, there's a nice you know, bunch of cow patties, lots of urine going in there. This is a happy, happy, happy chestnut tree. It's got fertilizer. It's got mulch. Uh, it's got all the sunlight coming to it. It will grow twice as fast. You wouldn't believe how fast the trees grow with judicious use of animals. We have to pay attention to this. This is a managed system. You don't just turn the animals loose and let them eat everything silly. Chickens. You cannot keep a chicken away from the back end of a cow. It's just amazing. They, they go right to it. I don't know why, but they like to go to the front end of a sheep at the back end of a cow. Whatever. They scratch up the cow patties, they spread it out, they eat any fly larvae that might be in there, and when they spread that manure out, uh, now you don't get this hyper green tuft of grass that the cattle won't eat next year. They even out that uh, manure pack. And there they are at the front end of a sheep, and um, these are obviously free range chickens, and they have to learn how to fend for themselves uh, with the, amongst the predators and everything. We have what we call Jurassic chickens. And they've figured out how to survive semi-wild. They come home to a coop at night, which is nice. Uh, but these two girls right here, they've got to be at least six or seven years old. And they're still around. These are the dominant girls. They've taught generations of chickens how to live as wild Jurassic chickens. So, so basically the whole gist of my whole conversation here today is that 
if we're going to imitate nature, observe nature, imitate nature, and interact with it, which is what Bill Mollison said in the Permaculture's Designer's Manual, I mean, let's really do this. Let's not just say, all right, let's imitate, let's observe nature and imitate it and interact with it. Let's make a mud oven. A mud oven is a nice little detail, but you've missed the whole point because you've failed to design a system that's ecologically sound and economically profitable. Within this system, sure, let's go make a mud oven. That's great. But let's design human ecosystems that produce our food, fuels, medicines, fiber, our staple food crops, our carbohydrates, proteins, and oils, a full range of vitamins and minerals. This is an extremely nutritious diet, even if you don't eat the animals. Um, and that's all I have to say for today on this part of things. You guys are all awesome. Thank you for bearing with me. And just in case you were wondering, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Is anybody even still there anymore? Don't tell me I've given a webinar with nobody there. We're oh, yeah. here still. Awesome. <laughs> it went so silent. It's like, oh no, I can't believe it. I just gave an hour <laughs> webinar to nobody. Left. To nobody. Everyone <laughs> left in the first two minutes. No, I, I think I think everyone's got something great out of that. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so uh, Wayne, so I, I can't you... hear your mic, but I think Wayne wanted to, to talk about. Ah, I did. You know what? Oh, I, um, boy, I didn't. I was. I was so excited I didn't unmute. So yeah, Mark, there are hundreds out there. So I'm going to, uh, let's let Mark take a little breath and I'm just going to grab the screen for a second and for um, talk for a little bit and then Mark's going to come back and answer a bunch of questions, folks. So anyway, um, obviously if you like that and a bunch of you are already putting in, thank you, thank you, thank you, throw in some ones or something on there because that was an awesome presentation. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how you can get a little bit more of Mark if you'd like to. Um, so if you like what you just watched, how would you like to get up to 50 more hours of this kind of education from Mark and being able to regularly work with him on a personal level? Um, we have something that some of you have heard of, some of you are actually a part of, called the Economic Action Team. And um, what if you could get up to 15 hours a week of live broadcasts of world experts teaching, coaching, mentoring, on topics like ecological aquaculture, sustainable indoor agriculture, natural regenerative livestock production, soil health, alternative health concepts, the sharing economy, and much, much more. Well, you can do that. Um, the economic action team, EAT, is a new paradigm for helping people make some money by making the planet better. We call that colonomics. So where's that word come from? There's this guy named Dennis Weaver that some of you older folks probably heard of who formed this entity called the Institute of Economics. It's a nonprofit 501c3 back in 1993. Dennis died, unfortunately, about 10 years ago, and he asked me to take it over. And I've been doing that for the last number of years. And we've helped literally hundreds of entrepreneurs build successful planet-bettering businesses and have taught starving people around the world to feed themselves. Back in June of this year, we started this program called the Economic Action Team, so about five months ago. So what do we do? Well, we do live teaching and coaching sessions on relevant topics um, for up to about 10 hours a week. Teachers are always doers. These are not people that are just sort of learning about something or are college professors. We don't pitch. There's no pitching and no hurrying. This isn't on some hour schedule. Mark has been teaching about forest ecology for 20 weeks. And he told me the other night, I think I might have 20 more. So whatever you think you got tonight, multiply that by you know, 50 or 100 and you could get that. Um, we have replays of all the sessions that are available forever to what we call our elite members. Um, we have live events. We've already had one out here in Colorado at my ranch. We're going to do one in Southern California in December or January. We're going to move them around the world, and they'll be free for our members. We also have private networking groups to interact and form business relationships through Facebook pages that are, that are for the team. And you can make some money yourself if you get involved. So you can join this today for free. And I'm going to show a couple pictures of the site here in just a second. Actually, I'll probably move to, move to that right now. Here's where you can go to that website that was shown on that last slide. It's actually over on the chat section also, 
and you can click here where it says learn more you can go over here purchase offer for free and fill in a little information click that sign up for free and all of a sudden you will be a free member and that's where this replay will be also after the uh, after the session tonight but or today or tonight wherever you're out in the world um, but you can also um, go in and get replays and other kinds of information from that um, there's a first webinar that's on there that will give a lot more of an explanation of this than what I'm giving right now. Beyond that, we've got a special deal today. Um, about a month ago now, or a little less than that, we started um, charging for what we call an elite membership. Um, we, I'll talk a little bit more about members and such in just a minute, but we decided that it's just a part of, of Neil and, and Raleigh allowing us to, to, to bring and come on to this that we would do a special deal. And right now, just for this group, you can become an elite member of our EAT project team for $2. Um, this is a huge value. And what do you get for that? So less than a cup of coffee. You get a one month membership in our, in our project. You get access to all the live coaching, teaching, mentoring sessions. You get access to super private Facebook community, which that's a secret group they call, and I'm gonna show that in a second. You get to personally interact with coaches. You get access to all of our replays, which grow at right now at an average of about six to 10 hours a week, and you get all of those, um, and it's growing daily. You get free admittance to events. Maybe the most important is you get to access 3,000 other members that are involved in this around the world. And I'm gonna go to, um, to this page right here. I just wanna show you just a couple of things that people say about this. There's hundreds of these, by the way. Janet says, Wayne, this is a fabulous project. I commend you and your presenters, team, whoever, for sticking to your necks out and putting the time to help. I look forward to learning more. Um, here's, uh, here's Lynn. Such, such pressure to be interesting. Won't want to oblige, but thank you. She was going to look. She wanted to talk. Mike Barnes, I absolutely enjoyed being at the recent event. I'm pretty certain I'm in the right place at the right time. Um, looking forward to all the training. Um, it's probably a very accurate point that we're unlikely to make big changes. And so he talks about how I appreciate that you guys are making a path to do that. Again, I could show you all kinds of those. I don't want to like, take a lot of time. Mark's going to come back on here in just a second and answer questions. So um, anyway, you have the ability right now to join this for a couple bucks. And to do that, again, you go to that same site that I was on previously, and uh, you just click on instead of the free, you click, I'll show you exactly how to do it here, um, you click on the elite team member and you say learn more. There's actually a little video here you can watch. There are two different ways you can join it and you go down and you click on this one and you will put in a coupon and that's just for this group. Oops, I got the wrong one. I'm going to back up, go to the other one. I didn't click on the right deal there. Click here and go down and go to this one and you can then put a coupon code in so the sustainable design masterclass SDMC click apply and all of a sudden that will go to two dollars and that's all you'll need to do with that and that's for a month. At the end of that month, you will be billed, if you want to stay involved, $75 a month. You can quit at any time. There's no contracts. You can just do it for as short or as long as you want. However, if you quit any time during the second month, you're also going to get that free because we have 100% guarantee for that 30 days. And you can just say, hey, I want to get out. We'll refund your money, and you won't have to pay that. We're also going to give some bonuses just for this group. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to have a question and answer session with Mark. I'm going to be on it too, but mainly for Mark in the near future where you can just hang with Mark for an hour. He's not going to do any lecture, any talking. You can ask whatever questions you want. Think of it. You get a personal session with Mark. We're also going to throw in 15 hours of a course that we have that would normally cost $500. Um, that is a workshop that Mark did in Colorado a little bit less than a year ago um, that I, you wouldn't even believe the amount of teaching that you'll get there. Um, if you want, you can also join, that's what I had up earlier, for a year, pay it at one time, and we usually charge $750 for that. We'll give a $250 discount here today, and that's a $250 value for that. 
If you choose to remain a monthly member for 12 months, you never have to pay again, and you're now a member for life. And so kind of in summary, uh, you can join at that link. It's also on the screen here on the right. Um, there's those top different things that I talked about. This is only going to be available until November 1st. So if you want to do it, you've got to do it by sometime late in the day at Halloween. If you've got any other questions, you can get a hold of me at the email address that's shown here. We'll put it over on the right also. And that's all I've got. And let's turn it over to Mark for some questions. And Mark, if you want to take the screen back, we can just, I'll just, I'm going to leave it on this screen for just a little if, bit. Though. If uh, you guys are going to have to do that, I've lost my control panel. And I don't even see you guys at all. I can hear you, but I don't see anything that's happening. So, you know, if you want me to take the screen, you'll have to, you guys Actually, have to put I, it I, I don't think you need it, Mark. You can probably just, we can just go to the questions. So. Yeah, it's all right. Yep. So there are a lot of them here. And Raleigh and Neil, you guys throw in which ones that you would like him to address also. I'm just going to take what I see at the bottom. Um, when trees are planted, uh, whoa, it's changed. Okay. This is coming from uh, Jack. And when trees are planted close together, they tend to grow tall. Once um, that started and they thinned out, will those remaining um, branch out um, later or, or wider? Yeah, they'll, they'll start to branch out later. It'll never be gigantic, large branches uh, close to the ground um, as it, you know, if you had planted that way to start with. But you also think about well, part of what I'm trying to do is I also want to have light penetration. I want to make sure that that grass is growing vigorously underneath. And I'm also going to be in there every once in a while with my tractor to do finish mowing to get rid of undesirable species or to chip branches or to, to you know, help chop up any kind of you know, fruit or nuts that, uh, that um, I want to help to assist the decomposition process. So I don't want branches sweeping me off the, uh, off the tractor. And so, yeah, some of those, they'll fill out. They, they won't look the same as a classic orchard tree, and I don't really care if they do because I've been able to, you know, get, I didn't show a lot of pictures of apple trees. Oh, my goodness. Uh, if you were an apple, quote, unquote, orchardist and you saw my apples, you get it. You get indigestion. You'd throw up probably because this is not the way that you're taught that apples are supposed to look. But I'm getting so many yields out of it. I'm getting um, iris and daffodils for cut flowers in the spring. I'm getting comfrey as medicinal herb in the spring. I'm getting mushrooms that are flushing early in the spring. Uh, we're getting at least two grazings, cattle and hogs. So that's what six different yields before we even get around to harvesting apples, which are one of the seven yields so far. Well, then we grade right in the field. The apples go on the ground. Uh, then uh, we turn the pigs loose again, and then we turn the cattle loose. We've got nine different yields coming out of that apple orchard. Apples happen to be one of them. They do not look like a classic apple orchard. There are a lot of them are these real scrizzly trees with funny little branch patterns, but I don't care. Zero input, you know, uh, nothing but yield out of it. Um, that's how I do it. <laughs> So Silas asks, by the way, Silas is a, is a an EAT team member and contributes a lot. He asks, like to hear more about your Jurassic chickens. He says, I've been having trouble getting them established, and, and um, he's thinking about doing guard dogs. The, actually, the guard dogs is not a bad idea. With the, with the, with the Jurassic chickens, it took about three years of 90% losses to, uh, to finally get uh, something happened in the survivors that they just figured it out. Um, also, we have lots of cover. They can hide under bushes and shrubs all over the place. And so then it was about four, five years, maybe six years of almost zero losses uh, per year. Then a couple of things happened. Uh, I never saw our dog out there guarding chickens. The dog just hung around the house and barks at random stuff at night. Well, our dog was hit and killed by uh, the, <laughs> the health inspector coming to help my cider operation. So the dog went away. That's a factor. How much of a factor, I don't know. Well, then all of a sudden we started to lose chickens. Um, more predation started to happen. So I think a couple of things went on. I think one is that it took a number of years for the chickens to figure out how to evade predators. Then I think it took the predators a number of years to figure out how to go get smart chickens then when you combine that with a dog missing, now the predators are a lot more bold and, and they'll, they're, they're willing to come around more and so there's a lot more pressure on the chickens. 
I still have Jurassic chickens and Jurassic guineas. They are multiplying and expanding on their own. Uh, I haven't done anything to our chicken or guinea flock, um, so to speak, for the past two years. And I'm actually re thinking about restocking the population with another you know, flush. And how we've done it in the past is we'll just save a bunch of eggs because the chickens come into the coop um, uh, most of the time at night. In the winter, they definitely do. Then in the late spring, we'll, we'll start saving their eggs. Then you incubate a whole bunch of eggs, uh, and then you hatch them out, and you throw them underneath the uh, adult birds. Or you go ahead and you raise them in a brooder and then keep them until they're feathered out and then turn them loose with the experienced birds. And expect predation. Don't, don't worry about it because we're not interested in the ones that, that don't survive. We're interested in the survivors because they've got something going for them, either genetic uh, characteristic that helps them or an intelligence characteristic, some kind of behaviors. Behaviors are oftentimes learned between parent and child. Uh, so uh, keep trying and try to lower your expense by raising your own chicks from your own eggs. Yeah, and, and guys, if you want to ever talk more about that, I have about 1,500 chickens on my ranch and a variety of different purposes, and there's a bunch of them that are Jurassic. We do raise our own eggs, and, and they're amazing in what they can do. So, Mark, here's one that I've heard a bunch of different times before. Um, this is from Michael Cooley, who says, um, thank you, first. He says, awesome, as always. And he says, I get the question from my students often as to what to do to transition to a forest ecology system in urban and suburban areas? Well, you can you just go ahead and do it. <laughs> the same principles apply. The, uh, the only thing is uh, what you will end up with uh, on smaller sites, uh, even if they're small rural sites, a lot of the uh, pest and disease benefits that you get and a lot of the genetic uh, uh, benefits in your populations of plants and animals they require a certain, a certain scale, a certain size before you have some sort of effect that you notice. So like pest control on apples using animals in a mixed system like that while spraying nothing, I don't know how small you can get until all of a sudden you don't have enough. And I'll, I'll, I'll use squash as an example because I've grown squash a lot. I'm very familiar with it. Uh, in order to have every gene expressed in an acorn squash, you need to have 40 acres of plants at 1,200 plants per acre. So it's like 50, 60,000 squash plants, acorn squash plants, before every gene, you know, randomly speaking, has had an opportunity to express itself. So that, you can't do that in the suburbs. So if you're going to save seed, for example, in the suburbs, you're going to lose traits naturally. You're just going to lose traits because you don't have enough uh, expressions of those, of those traits. Now, on the pest and disease cycle, you plant your 10 squash plants in the backyard. First thing that comes in is cucumber beetles or squash beetles, and you say, I'm not going to spray anything. They come in, and they eat your whole entire squash. They're gone because you didn't have enough squash to feed the predators. You need first to have enough squash to feed the predators, and then enough predators that you don't kill. You don't spray them and you know, squash them and all that kind of stuff. You need to have enough pests in order to attract the predators. And so you've got to be able to have a certain scale uh, in order to have those ecological processes. I would go ahead and do it. I've got a 15-foot diameter circle. It's right underneath. Uh, it's actually right underneath the, uh, the, the R up here. 15-foot diameter circle. That's the oak uh, plant family community planted in a circle. It's even mulched, so people in the, in the suburbs and cities won't freak out that it's not mulched. Um, if you're in a situation like that and that's all you have, you may have to do some controls of, of pests and diseases because you don't have a large enough system to have the uh, ecological processes uh, at the scale where they're functional. And what those scales are, nobody knows yet because you're not funding the research, Michael. Write a check. <laughs> so Thomas is located, it says thank you, and he's located in the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia. It gets 12 inches of rainfall or moisture annually. Uh, summers are mild, winters are cold. Um, do you think restoration ag system would work for him? I will tell you that almost describes where I live and yes it will work and then Mark you go ahead and answer. All I can say is does the Okanagan Valley have any plants or animals there at all? That's one question. If the answer is yes, 
well then absolutely restoration agriculture works period because you go and you imitate the plant communities that are natural native naturalized to your area that have a long track record of growing with sheer total utter neglect and then you imitate you observe what's working you imitate that you plant it hyper dense to get more genetic variations and then you interact with it and that means harvest 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 especially in drier areas high density plantings in drier areas it's possible that you can actually suck all the moisture out of the soil and have the whole system collapse so in a drier area you will want to be extra ruthless about removing plant material imitate the plant communities around you and in the Okanagan you know you're definitely uh, with the within the whole oak zone, you're definitely within the pine zone. Now I'm getting wicked feedback. I think it's because, I think it's because Neil came in, so there's a little feedback there. So yes, it'll work. <laughs> um, here's a great one. Um, we have contamination in our soil. This is from Karen, by the way. We have contamination in our soil from local mines, lead, zinc, and cadmium, especially. We are looking for ways to um, to basically plant trees to help with this uh, while improving the soil ecology. Are there better resources to learn about proper plants to help with this um, great webinar? Yeah, I would, I would just do some research on bioremediation and phytoremediation. You know, there, there are certain plants that accumulate certain things. Uh, and I do know from experience in the northeast part of the U.S. is that willows uh, really hyper accumulate cadmium and so if you go ahead and you just uh, you plant all these willows and then you harvest the willows and you ship it away you get rid of it send it to the landfill because you don't necessarily want you don't want to compost with that because you'll just reconcentrate all that cadmium you don't necessarily want to burn it the, the cadmium will go some of it will go away with the smoke but most of it will stay in the ash so if you do burn it, just use it for you know for you know firewood or whatever, and then get rid of the ash. You don't you don't want to have that stuff around. So bioremediation and phytoremediation, there are a lot of specific plants for specific contaminants. And if I had had a client call me with a with a, a contaminant issue like that, uh, for one, I'd do more specific research on the contaminants involved, and for two, I'd bring in Wayne as my sidekick because that's this is more of his expertise than mine. I do. Yeah. Neil and, and Raleigh are back on here. Do you guys have anything specific and you said you were screening through the questions that you want to pick out or anything you guys have yourselves? I will say on the on the phytoremediation, we are having Peter McCoy on on December 1st. Um, if you can't afford to hire Wayne as your consultant on that. Um, Peter Peter's done some really fantastic work on the mushroom side of things. Uh, and I'm really excited that we're going to have him on. That's all. I'm plugging our December show. All right. That's good. Raleigh, do you have anything else? As for me, yeah. Uh, for those who want to join future webinars, yeah, we've got Peter McCoy. Uh, who's the other? Yeah, we got Neil on two desert terraforming webinars in the next month. So any of you in the drylands, definitely, definitely check out those because those are going to be mind-blowing like no one else in the world is going the same the kind of things that Neil is doing so if any of you want any insights into the drylands then sign up for those uh, I'll send an email about both these things up right after the Q&A you'll get the replay of this and uh, yeah the invite to Wayne's awesome eat program it's gonna be good Thank you, and, and everybody. These are amazing classes these guys do. Um, Neil was just unbelievable a week ago, and he'll. I'm looking forward. I'm sure you guys are going to be for what he's going to do the next couple of weeks. So, just take some time. Here's a really great question, Mark. This is somebody from France. Um, actually, some initials M H K, and he's got rodent problems, and um, rodent so bad that he has trouble even keeping plantings and so on. Uh, walnuts and chestnuts. So any thoughts for him? Part of part of that is utilization. If if you end up having any of the crop that's left on the ground, other things will come in and eat that. And so what we have around here is you know the pigs do all the cleanup, so there's hardly any nuts left over on the ground. Uh, then we have, you know, the wild deer and the wild uh, uh, squirrels will come in and get it. But if you have 
you know, serious rodent issues, one of the things you might want to do. I did in the early years. I haven't even, you know, I haven't even been to them in years. If you look, uh, you can't see my screen, but if, if you were to look at my screen, out here I put a snake hibernaculum, and then over here I put a snake hibernaculum. I basically dug a pit four foot deep and like four foot around and, and filled it full of broken pieces of concrete block and rocks. And then uh, on, the, on the east or the south-facing side, of things now they made the presenter. Wow, cool. Oh, that's gone. <laughs> um, so, anyways, over uh, over on this part over here, I put in a snake hibernaculum, and over here, I put in a snake hibernaculum, and we get uh, what we call king snakes out here, like four, five foot long snakes that my rodent uh, problem like evaporated within a in a period of you know two years. They were gone, and it wasn't until two or three years ago that. Um, uh, chipmunk, chipmunks started to make a big uh, increase again. So I'd, I'd go ahead and I'd recommend rodent hibernac I mean uh, snake hibernacular for one, and then put out hawk roosts. Uh, about every 200 feet or so, just put up a pole, you know, 20, 30 foot in the air, so hawks can roost on it during the day, and uh, owls can roost on it uh, at night, and that'll just help. It's fattening up the ecosystem to limit something that you already have a problem. Either that or figure out a, uh, uh, a rodent soup recipe and, and post that later online. What I've done actually back with, with the mice uh, in, a, in a, uh, my property up in Maine that has a lot of beech trees, I would take uh, a PVC tee and put caps on either end of it and then about four inch diameter. This so was just a little tee, you know, it ends up being about a foot wide and a foot long and put it at the base of the trees scattered here, here and about. So I had all these rodents all over the place. They're stealing all my beech nuts anyways. So what I would do is I'd put these little stashes for them and they would gather up all the beech nuts and I'd put them in these little pieces of PVC. Then I could walk around from tree to tree, dump it out, obviously sanitize to get rid of any things that the rodents might carry. So use them as a tool somehow if you can also. So here's a good one, and I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. So this is coming from Yakislav, and it, it, he says thank you first, and then he says, I have a question about farm startup. And then uh, here's what he said. If you were on a budget, <laughs> and yeah, Mark is on a budget, I guarantee that. Knowing what you know now, what is the most important thing you would do? So um, take yourself back to those 20 years ago, Mark, because you were on a budget, that's for sure. Water management, and then imitate the the plant, natural plant communities of your place. That this picture right here of, of that farm. The reason why it works so well is I'm not trying to do something that doesn't belong here, and I'm not trying to force it to look like a picture that came out of a book. I am taking the species that are adapted to the the weather, the climate, the soil type. Uh, you know the the plants that belong in this region are here, the grasses that belong in this region are here, and instead of trying to manage it like a farm or an orchard, I manage it as if it were a natural resource property, more like a uh, someone who was in, in the timber uh, industry where they buy a, uh, a property, you know, plant it with trees, and then with minimal inputs throughout the years, every time they do some sort of entry onto a site, they want to yield something. Well, that's what I want to do, so I treat it more like a natural ecosystem instead of a farm. So water management and imitate your, your, uh, your natural plant communities. Those are the two most important things right there. And live a good life. Live a good life. Yeah. So Mary in Idaho is at 3,000 feet in a pine forest. She says, do you know of any good re references, books, anything on pine forest area like, like she has? Well, I wish I did. You know, you can find references, uh, you know, on forest ecology and forest management, stuff like that. But what you won't find yet, because this is all just getting started, uh, the, the ecosystem mimicry style agriculture, it's just getting started. So there aren't a lot of references out there. However, you are in an area where pinyon pine uh, will survive and thrive. So if you start looking up, you know, pinyon pine ecology, where does it fit in the successional pathway of your area? Uh, you're probably strong in a Ponderosa, uh, Ponderosa neighborhood, and so Ponderosa is usually um, a little bit less frequently disturbed than uh, Pinon. 
and, and you'll just have to find some seed source near you. I know um, Lawyer Nursery uh, has a, a, a location in Plain, Montana, and they source a lot of uh, material specifically. So if you call Lawyer Nursery and uh, get pinyon material from them that came near you and start in that particular direction with, with uh, the pine uh, areas, you know, elk are part of the system, whether they're on your place or not. Um, they, were, they were regularly burned and they were regularly grazed. So if you can figure out how to graze that area uh, in such a way that you don't damage the pine resource, get your new pine, your pinions established, now you're using the grazing as a cash flow for you, food, and a management tool in order to uh, reduce the competition with your newly established pinions. Um, uh, it's also will be the fertility for your newly established pinions. That would be a great way to, to, to start that system and go in that direction. So I would I just look up you know pinion pine ecology and uh, forest management references. But you got to have to twist it in your mind and twist it from the how am I going to use these understood truths. How am I going to use those to produce food, fuels, medicines, fiber for myself and my family? And, and obviously, everybody, there's a bunch of questions kind of like this about references and things, and I'm going to say it. The, the reality is you won't find a lot of what Mark's talking about here. The, that's why I highly recommend, if you could, get in this the free EAT program and, and come and watch him live because you're going to hear new and different things, you won't find other references like that. That there isn't, You're not going to find a university class that teaches this. We talk about this forest ecology class that Mark's doing right now as graduate school on, on forest ecology. So that's the best sources you're going to get. And, um, and the forest ecology, forest ecology education curriculum that you'll get is not about how to take the principles of forest ecology and use those understandings to, to produce food for yourself in some sort of business. That's what I've been doing for the past 30 years of my life is taking you know, ecology curriculums and using that as my economic livelihood and feeding myself. I think this one's going to be pretty, pretty easy, but uh, I'll let you answer it. Um, Jack asks, uh, I'm thinking about planting an Osage um, orange hedge. Would this be good to keep in chickens um, or just larger animals? Well, I would ask one, why would you plant an Osage orange hedge? So that's just a, a basic background question I would ask. Well, then, then of course, uh, animals would do well in there with them. Uh, if you're thinking about planting Osage orange, I kind of got a basic ballpark of where you're at in the, you know, in somewhere in the Plains region, uh, Midwest region. Is there another species that you could find that is as drought tolerant and wind hardy as an Osage orange? that might provide some sort of food for you and or food for the chickens, um, et cetera. And one of the plants that does that, you may want to be careful with it if you're further north in the colder climates, is the Siberian peach rub because it drops oodles and oodles and oodles of, of mung bean sized little uh, beans on the ground. It's also nitrogen fixer, extremely wind hardy and uh, drought hardy. Uh, that's an another option. But yeah, you can use animals in there. You can use animals in with any tree species. Uh, some of the ones you have to be a little bit more careful with are the tree species with shallow roots that are easily damaged by a hoof action. And what you want to make sure, especially with Osage orange, it's a very, uh, it tends to really exclude grasses from underneath them. So continually to continually prune the branches up so you can have grass growing all the way to the base if you're going to be raising animals in there. But if you're exclusively doing it as a windbreak, how about hazelnut? You know, there's these little nuts on hazelnuts that like are very tasty and, and eatable and stuff like that. It's another you know super useful plant for similar conditions where an Osage orange would, would survive. And I'm going to answer just a little differently because if you're asking a little different question, which is will will the hedge that gets created keep chickens in? No, I'll tell oh, you that right no, now. No, 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 no um, it will not. No. They're going to get out. <laughs> so um, that that now, one's now if you want to make. If you want to make a hedge that'll keep livestock in, you're going to have to lay the hedge and weave it through time. It'll take, it'll take seven to ten years of weaving a good hedge. My favorite hedge for weaving is uh, is hawthorn. You know, nice big, you know, three-inch long spikes. First hawthorn hedge I ever did was up in Alaska, and we did it intentionally to exclude moose from a market garden, and it works really, really well. 
I, I had a question just because he he was a homie from uh, he was on Versaland too. This is from Matt. Matt from Michigan. Have you noticed any invasive tendencies with your use of sweet clover? And let's say with invasive species that you don't want, what are you using to control them? Well, what's interesting is the whole concept of invasion. When you lay that concept in front of any word, that it's like putting uh, sunglasses on. Now everything you look at is colored by your sunglasses. So when you say invasive species, you're automatically looking at the invasion and not actually understanding how a species is is moving on to a site, how is it propagating, what conditions does it prefer, what conditions does it avoid. So if you just get rid of the word invasives for a second and try to understand that species, you'll learn a lot more about it. And then by learning a lot more about it, now how do we want to interact with this? Because if you have a species, and here's some that I have. I have the Tartarian honeysuckle, the multiflora rose. I have um, uh, uh, autumn olive, for example, just three. Those, I got the whole host of quote-unquote invasive species that are horrible and nasty. Well, how are they acting? How are they behaving? Uh, are they interfering with what I want to accomplish? Or are they helping uh, to accomplish what I want to accomplish? How can I utilize them? Those are all questions that I ask myself. And so uh, with with those species that are commonly called invasive species, if there's some place that I don't want them, they now become part of my management strategy because I have a reason to be in this particular place on this, you know, uh, on the farm, and I'm now managing for chestnut, for example, or I'm managing for hazelnut, or I'm managing for apples, or whatever it is. That's what I'm managing for. So my management technique, I will now have studied the species in question and figure out how to disrupt that species uh, the most effectively when I'm managing for hazelnut. If it's where I don't care that, that they live, they can go live. They're here. They're part of the system. They're naturalized. You know, it is what it is. Some of the things I have noticed about uh, autumn olive is if you go by and you trim off all of the stems except for one to try to train it like a tree, it doesn't like that and within a few years will die. I've also noticed that if you put the front end loader down flat on float so it's hor perfectly horizontal with the ground and you just put it at ground level and you drive into it at about seven or eight miles an hour, it just shatters it enough, breaks it at the roots enough that that thing just gives up and quits. Uh, Multiflora rose, you know, is managed mostly by is mostly by mowing. There's also a, a virus that's getting into the multiflora rose, and by letting it stay longer periods of time, I'm getting more and more of the multiflora rose is getting the virus. Uh, there are other species like uh, white mulberry. It's considered an invasive species. It's now illegal in the state of Wisconsin to for nurseries to sell sell white mulberry. Well, doggone it, it's one of the most useful species around. It starts putting out berries in June and it goes until September. And when the mulberries are ripe and falling off the trees, that's where you'll find the pigs. So get rid of that word invasive for a second. Understand the species that you're talking about. Uh, and then understand how they propagate, how do they spread, what are the soil conditions that they like, the shade, the light, exposed soil, not exposed soil, organic matter, not organic matter then you figure out how to manage uh, your other crops or your other you know, parts of the system at the key times that will, that will set back that uh, undesired species the most. Uh, black locust is another one in my place that that's probably, that's probably the one that I spend the most time working with and I just have to wait until it gets to the point that it's not quite killing my other trees from you know over competition for shade and light and moisture and nutrients and all that and then I just cut it for firewood and there's a big nitrogen flush and then the uh, my other plants uh, do much better because of that nitrogen release but now I've got it clipped close enough to ground that I can go ahead and I can mow regularly and the animals can graze it. Sweet clover, man if I had yellow sweet clover acting as invasively as they tell me this here's a plant that that, that there's like a spike of, of flowers six, seven, eight foot tall, a million seeds, you know, per per plant, and the honeybees absolutely love it. It's got a taproot that goes halfway to Australia, busts up any kind of clay hard pan, cracks through the rocks. It's an amazingly useful plant, uh, high in protein. Uh, you don't want to use it too much as an animal feed if you have animals that are uh, giving birth because it actually does have uh, the natural 
warfare in it, which is a blood thinner, and you can have animals bleed to death. I, I love that plant, and if it acted just a little bit more invasively at my place, I wouldn't mind at all. So, what do you guys see, Neil or Raleigh? Next question. We're getting close to getting through them here. So, here's a here's a good one. I think this is a very good one from Nicholas Uder. He says, "Curious about what perennial wholesale markets you see succeeding the fastest culturally and economically." Well, culturally and economically, uh, let's go economically first, and culturally, other than. Uh, the USA. <laughs> the, uh, the hazelnut currently right now is for all practical purposes in a state of chronic shortage worldwide. Um, culturally uh, the European cultures love to eat it. Uh, Asian cultures are, are eating it more and more and more. Culturally as far as planting enough plants to actually access the real market at scale in the USA American farmers are like deer in the headlights they're like well I don't see it on the end cap of every single aisle in the grocery store therefore there's no market for it I'm not gonna grow it or I grew 50 plants and I couldn't sell them anywhere it's like well you know what we need is is to get to scale so hazelnuts right off the bat uh, they, when we're working with people around the world and other parts of the world they're putting in thousands of acres uh, in order to meet this shortage of of hazelnuts for the for the for the world market but what you can't do is you can't do it like I'll put in 10 plants and see if I if it works for me it's like saying yeah I'm gonna grow number two dent corn I'll put in 10 plants and see if I make a business out of it and if it works then I'll go and I'll plant a thousand acres you know we're, we're talking we need to do this kind of agriculture at scale and you may not be able to do it at scale on your particular property but we need to collaborate with our neighbors uh, and form co-ops or companies or whatever we want to call it to aggregate that product, process the product, and get it in the marketplace. So hazelnuts and chestnuts are, are two uh, radically underserved markets right now. And what's uh, amazing about um, both of those is they're natural and native in Europe. They're all over the place and they're not even being harvested. People aren't even harvesting them uh, for whatever reason. They're, they're like the hillsides and areas are just covered with chestnut and hazelnut and nobody's even harvesting them and so I don't I don't understand uh, there's some kind of cultural phenomena going on there that here's this amazing resource that nobody's harvesting uh, so I think those are, are two really good ones um, right off the bat right now um, uh, pecans are another one what's interesting with pecans is at least in the US the current industry has kind of tried to position things and make it so that you only like the big gigantic pecans um, and then there's a some somewhat tight controls over the genetic material but there's nobody right now for any practical purposes who's just producing boatloads of pecans uh, for the wholesale market not as a specialty eight dollar a pound thing but we're talking more like eight dollar a bushel because we're growing it broad scale broad acre in its natural habitat with minimal inputs everybody's trying to do it as an orchard crop as a specialty crop um, so those are those are like the big three for, for me right now I'd say chestnut hazelnut pecan are big ones I'm gonna jump in here real quick uh, there's a bunch of questions where people are saying I'm in this location at this elevation with this amount of precipitation and then saying what can I grow or what should I do or how do I operate in this particular spot. Um, the, and the answer that everyone's going to give you in, in a short form like this is it's really going to depend on a host of different factors. But the, uh, one of the things I spoke about last week is if uh, I'm definitely with Mark where you, if you can find out what your dominant ecology was um, before it became overrun with people or urbanized or whatever, that's the best way to go. But if that's not something that you can actually do, then the next step to move on to is to create something called a climate analog where you kind of fly around the world looking at the same elevation, uh, same latitude, same kind of climate, and see, oh, I'm in northern Colorado, maybe, Kazakh, maybe Kazakhstan matches a lot of my climate conditions. Let's look at what they're growing over there. 
Um, and last week's webinar is not available for free anymore, but I do have an article up on my website on how to create a climate analog so you can figure out what to grow on your site. Um, and that's, I'll, we'll put up a link for you, send it to you in, in our follow-up email on that. Because there's like 10 different people asking that same question, but for different areas on here. The other thing that people are asking a lot is courses, and we'll put some resources on. Again, I, I gave some private answers in there to some people that, that what we don't want to do is specifically talk about other people that you can find out, you know, we don't want to demean anybody. Some people are asking opinions on people and their plans. We're not, we're not going to do that. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk with you privately about some things if you'd like and so on. We, we get all these questions and we can, we can work with them later also. Yeah, and Here, back to good the, question. The whole, just wanted to go back to Neil's comment on the analog. Between the answer that I gave and the answer that Neil gave, I think that that encapsulates about 100% of what we're talking about is we are creating analog ecosystems. This picture of New Forest Farm, this is not a oak savanna. This is not a purist oak savanna, but it's about the closest thing that you can get to an oak savanna while still having these agricultural yields that are coming off of it, agricultural yields that are feeding my family, feeding livestock, and generating enough of a surplus that I have an economy that pays the bills. And that's, it. that's, that's the sum total of what we're talking about. Analog agroforestry is another word that I've used. There's other outfits that are promoting analog agroforestry. So you got it, Neil. That's the answer. Yeah. Here's, here's a good question I see coming from Derek real quick. Uh, I think it applies a lot because there's so many diseases popping up for apple trees and fruit and nut trees. This is one that's like, do you take special care to isolate diseased apple trees or, or diseased varieties from each other? No, absolutely not. Here's, this, this goes back to what I was talking about with cucumber beetle. I want to have high levels of pests and diseases on my farm, period, because then I know that the ones that don't get it have some sort of resistance going on. And uh, what I've also done is I continually am breeding my own varieties. That We now have to bring uh, accelerated mass selection breeding as a part of what we do. We'll have a smaller little plot here, and we're just planting oodles and oodles and oodles of plants. And then if we're intentionally not uh, treating them for any pests or diseases, and we're not trying to limit the pests and diseases, the plants that don't get the pests and diseases are naturally uh, resistant for some reason. And who cares what reason they're resistant? And if uh, I don't know if my screen is still being seen by everybody, but if you look at if you if it is, this area that I'm circling with the arrow is where chestnut blight started on New Forest Farm. Well, uh, I can't grow pure Chinese chestnuts on New Forest Farm because it's too cold in wintertime and freezes them to the ground, so I am anyways. Uh, and I can't grow pure American chestnuts on the farm because they'll get chestnut blight and die to the ground, but I am anyways. And I'm growing all these different other combinations thereof in, in between because what I first did is I put seed in the ground and I started selecting for trees that started to produce nuts within three years. And so I got hyper precocity into the gene pool as fast as I possibly could. My chestnut orchard, if you want to call it an orchard, looks like a bombed out diseased nightmare from somebody's bad dream. I'm in the chestnut business. I have probably higher levels of chestnut blight on this farm than anywhere else in the country. And I'm harvesting tons of chestnuts because the trees that I have that are growing here somehow are able to survive in this, in this high pest and high disease regime. That's what we're going for. As new diseases come up, if we're constantly breeding new plants, uh, and, and putting them out in a system and not trying to control the pests and not trying to control the diseases, only the ones that can survive the pests and diseases will reproduce and carry on. That's how nature does it, and that's how I'm doing it. And it's not going to look like an apple orchard for somebody else. It just doesn't look that way. Mark, this is one that, that's up here, and I'm paraphrasing it, but um, somebody that's got a property in a floodplain, and he says that once a year, every year, he gets a flood to where it's completely inundated un underwater. Guess what? A little bit like the property we're working on in Louisiana. 
So he says, how can I do silva pasturing and so on there? Why don't you just briefly talk about that? Well, uh, depending where the location is uh, would, would determine what species of bottomland uh, tree, shrub, bushes, and vines that you would go with. Uh, I, you may still be able to find some of the resources. It was starting to become popular for a while. Uh, the National Agroforestry Center was promoting a technique called water breaks. Uh, it's like a windbreak, but instead of um, you know slowing prevailing winds down to mitigate you know, the effects, the negative effects of uh, blowing wind, you'd put water breaks in. So, like in a in a floodplain, for example, you would make mounds uh, that uh, take the uh, powerful erosive force of a, of a stream, for example, and spread it out. So there would be like these herringbone-shaped mounds that would spread the water, the floodwaters, out as wide as it could, as fast as it possibly could. So that way you take any, any say, a, a one-foot rise in the, in the, in the uh, river here would now spread it out whoosh, all the way across the floodplain as quick as possible. That way you don't have a big uh, uh, heavy moving force that you don't have a lot of erosion going on on your site. Well, how you make those water breaks is you make an excavated ditch and then you make a mound. Well, now in this excavated ditch, if you are low enough down on the water table, like the property in Louisiana, you now make this trench. Now you do an aquaculture in the trench uh, and an easy, easy crop for aquaculture and, and slow, non-moving, uh, not regularly um, uh, refreshed water are, are crayfish, crawdads, whatever you want to call those. And so if you have this, this trench, uh, the, it's like it's a swale, you know, a pit and a mound not intended to spread the water out and soak the water in. You're in a floodplain. Water's not the issue. You want to make this dry spot on these mounds where you then plant, plant your bottom land trees. And uh, pecan are, a, are a, a, an epic floodplain tree. They're just incredible. All you need to do is give them a little bit of an elevation above the water. They can even handle being submerged for a couple of weeks at a time and it won't, it won't necessarily kill them. You know, pecan, elderberry, um, if you're further south, you know, I don't know where your location is. If you're further south, you can go with saw palmetto as, a, as an understory in with it. Um, a whole different host of, uh, of um, wetland adapted um, species that you can use right in with uh, uh, persimmons are in with, with, um, uh, with pecan, pawpaw, uh, passion fruit. And of course, in the alleys in between these berms and swales, now you're growing grass. And one recommendation for a civil pasture in a floodplain is when it's flooding, don't have your animals there. It's a good idea. So Neil and uh, Lorali, I think we can keep getting questions until um, until you know forever. So you guys kind of decide how many and more you want to be doing here. People are still hanging out here with us, and uh, a few more. We think we go another five minutes or so. If that's good with you guys, cool. I'm, yeah. I'm answering one with typing right now, so if you see another one there to ask, well, I'll go ahead with it. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, a lot of site-specific places. Um, one like Megan asks, kind of a big part questions. Like she's dealing with the degraded soil from a horse pasture, and she's asking. Uh, should she do the earthworks first and then plant the trees or or plant the trees first and then go for building the earthworks? So this kind of goes back to the scale of permanence. Yeah, yes, probably. You know, um, either way is fine. One of the one of the things that's interesting about um, planting trees is uh, the best time to plant tre trees, of course, was 20 years ago. The most expensive thing when it comes to planting trees is not the cost of the plant material itself. It's time. And so the, the, the priority is to get those trees in the ground as soon as you practically can. Absolutely the soonest thing you do, the longest trees to mature, get them in the ground soon, fast, right now. Well, however, you know, they kind of probably would do a little bit better with a little bit of uh, earthworks ahead of time. So why not couple the two, do the dirt works, and immediately follow up with, with um with the uh, tree planting, you know, all, all of the site-specific things. One of the permaculture principles that that I I kind of adhere to is we're going to do our designs and work from the pattern down to the details. 
And so what this webinar is all about, and, and basically what's been kind of my life's work, is like, let's get these patterns right. Because my goodness, if we, if we dial in our water management system and we pick the right species based on you know, the, the climate analog of wherever we are, or even the exact analog of an exact local ecotype, if we do those two things alone, really, 999% of our troubles go away. Then if we interact with our system in a way that is uh, analogous to the disturbance cycles that those uh, plant communities are adapted to, um, we're basically functioning within nature's rules and nature actually works in our favor because we're doing the same things that he, she, it, they would have done. Uh, now to get to the specifics, okay, it was an old horse pasture, almost guaranteed there's going to be wicked compaction, there's going to be uh, mineral nutrient balances out of whack, you know, there's all the different things that you can do with, with uh, you know, different soil tests for the mineral balance, Midwestern biolag type uh, soil tests, you can start playing with all the biologies a la you know, Elaine Ingham, but if you haven't started with the pattern first, that you're, you're going to be stuck in the details and the details uh, is going to end up with an input based system forever until you get that pattern right. So get your water management dialed in, uh, pick the species that are the plant communities that are going to work there, now work on the details for the rest of your life because the conditions are going to change slightly, always and forever. That's what the rest of your life is all about, is dealing with the details. Here's a great one about mushrooms because you went through it pretty quick and I don't think you want to go into great a little bit more about how you manage the mushrooms in your system. <laughs> over and over again I get, I get accused of, of giving you know, flip or glib answers. It's like, well, here's how I manage the mushrooms in my system is I like uh, inoculate the logs and ignore them. How about well, then, then, then I go cut them. When they're ready, I cut them. And, and she it. also asks, yeah. how, have, you, have you tried to market them in a commercial sense, the mushrooms? Well, I, actually, I did. I, I really, uh, really worked the shiitakes for a while. And it was such a nuisance getting the picture-perfect uh, mushrooms of exact right diameter that the wholesale market wanted um, that I, I figured out after two years that I didn't want to do that anymore because what I was going to have to do was uh, make some sort of enclosure to exclude uh, slugs, insects, birds, chipmunks, all that kind of stuff. And then, then I was going to have to have some sort of irrigation system so I had the perfect optimized humidity all the time. And it's like it was starting to become uh, too much input in order, you know, f for the yield that I was going to get out of it. And so um, basically what I do is I, I inoculate the material and then uh, put them in a, in a reasonable location I, and I just ignore them. Uh, the mushrooms that I do, uh, well, because I am a part of a produce marketing cooperative, uh, when I do have a flush that's extra strong, I just call my guy up. I say, hey, Jeffrey, you know, you need any... You know, you need any wine caps this week? He makes a couple of phone calls. He either says yes or he says no. If he says no, I, you know, I chop a whole bunch up. I dehydrate them. I feed to the pigs. I feed them to the chickens. Or I just take the caps off. It's funny because someone will say, "Oh yeah, but buying the spawn every year that's expensive." It's like, well, you just take the cap off. It's got spores in it. And you bury it under some new, you know, a new place that you just mowed and there's fresh grass laying down there, or you shove it under a pile of sawdust or something like that. Mushrooms make spores, and people are like, yeah, but you know, you got to keep buying the spawn if you're going to be doing shiitakes. They don't naturally spread, you know, in the, in the USA. Well, I've had shiitakes go into the roof of my chicken coop, so I don't know how they did that. And then when the log is about played out, you just break it apart with your with your hands, and you got all the the spawn run through this rotten wood, and then you shove that in the holes for a new for for a new inoculum of the next logs. So, and and is my success rate, you know. 99.999% on all of my inoculations? No, but what do I care? I drill a couple of holes, I shove a couple of pieces of rotten wood in, I throw it in the shade and I ignore it. And when the mushrooms are there, I've, I've been eating mushrooms uh, easily two to three times a day for the past month and a half here. It's been an incredible uh, mushroom season with all the, all the water. So I really don't do much at all. I just you know, put the spawn in the right place and ignore it. Awesome. Cool.
All right, so I, I promised this person I would answer him. This is Andrew from the UK. He's got all these questions about sheep and grazing sheep around his fruit trees. And his is like two-part question. How do you graze animals array in your fr around your fruit trees in a way that doesn't hurt them? And is there any types of species of sheep that you've seen that don't attack fruit trees? Well, like I said, if you look at my fruit trees, um, if you're an apple orchardist and expect it to look like an apple orchard, you've got another thing coming. This looks like a bombed out, stripped apart uh, disaster. Uh, however, it's a zero input way of growing you know, a, a high quality, picture perfect fruit with no sp sprays whatsoever. Uh, the cattle and sheep browse the lower branches of your trees. The sheep won't go up as high as the cattle do. Uh, when you remove the lower branches of the trees, there's a gap on my trees about you know four to five foot high with no foliage whatsoever. It's all broken, shattered branch stubs. Looks ugly. You've now short-circuited most of the fungal issues in your fruit because most of the spores end up uh, uh, being ripe when they're on the ground, and when a drop of rain hits it, the spore flies up. And if it hits an apple branch or foliage, it sticks and it continues. They continue to spread up the tree. So the animals, by removing the lower branches, short circuit the, um, the, the fungal ladder that the fungus could climb to get up onto your fruit. It also allows for more airflow underneath your trees as well. Now if you're leaving the sheep in there long enough so they're starting to strip bark off of it, that's not the sheep's fault, that's your fault. You've got to move those animals through the system. You put them in and you, you watch them graze and browse until they're starting to do just a little bit too much damage. When, they, when they're just in there browsing and nibbling and snapping some branches and stuff, they're not harming the trees. Once they've crossed over that fine fuzzy gray zone and they actually are harming the trees, that's when you should have acted just before that. So you, you can only learn that by, by working with the animals for a while and seeing when it is that it becomes harmful. And pigs are a similar way. Uh, I love what the pigs do to the base of the apple trees is they, they roll in the mud and then they scratch their butts on the apple trees and they buff the, the bark smooth so now you don't have all this big flaky bark which are nest sites for coddling moths. Uh, the pigs also will eat the June drop, so they're ingesting that first hatch of insects. Uh, so they're reducing the pest uh, pressure. Uh, cattle in the fall, after the leaves fall off, uh, around here the leaves are falling off right about now, and there's this lash flush of green grass before it all goes dormant. This is the time to get the cattle in there to eat up the uh, apple leaves off the orchard floor. And so they're, they're kind of digesting some of the extra fungal spores. You end up with this deep synergistic system that when you move the animals through at the appropriate time, and you move those sheep before they start to harm the plants. And I figure, and actually one of my inspirations uh, from a long way back when I was a little kid, uh, it was a foggy morning. We were on vacation in New Brunswick, and we're driving around, and we heard this funny sound, and we couldn't figure out what it was. We came around the corner, and there was an uh, apple orchard with daffodils as thick as can be. The daffodils uh, in the understory were in full bloom, and there were sheep grazing through it, and the sheep had bells on their necks, and that's what we heard with the bells ringing. Up on the hill was a shot tower where they used to make shot back in the you know, colonial period, so like a castle tower, and then the sun was coming up through the mist. It was like these you know, sunbeams through the mist, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sight. Sheep have been traditionally, historically, a part of apple orchards for as long as people have been eating apples. If they're harming your trees, it's not their fault. Uh, it's your management issue, and you've got to learn when to move them properly. Okay, great. I think this may be the last question from Niels. Uh, probably it's a bit open-ended, but can you give details on mechanical planting, management options, and your experience with it? So. Kinds, I guess, kinds of machines, how you use them, harvesting chestnuts with them, and et cetera. So f as far as mechanically planting, um, you know, there's a number of different mechanical uh, tree planters on the market. I use a DETCO, D-E-T-C-O, uh, tree transplanter. Um, made, I, I got it because it was manufactured here in Wisconsin. It works pretty good. A whole, whole bunch of different other kinds that work well. Now, if you're going to design a system so that it's uh, mechanically harvestable, you have to figure out the row spacings based on the machine that's going to be doing the harvest. And so uh, like hazelnuts, grapes, currants, uh, gooseberries, raspberries, 
they're all harvested with a straddle harvester. Our local Stratus harvester, the, the Corvan, K-O-R-V-A-N company, uh, they have a 10 foot, they have a requirement for 10 feet between rows of, of shrubs that they harvest. Go online and look at Mechanical Harvest of Olives on YouTube. It's amazing videos. The Savage Company makes a night nut sweeper, picker, upperer. You know, I'm just throwing out these names, not because I necessarily recommend them at all, but just because these are the ones that I'm familiar with. That'll sweep up walnuts and almonds and uh, uh, pecans, chestnuts, that sort of thing. And so the system has to be designed around your equipment. Um, you know, I, I highly recommend designing your system around your equipment, whether you're using a wheelbarrow, uh, draft animals, or, you know, uh, you know, machines. Design the system around your equipment so it's easy to deal with. And then the mowing, uh, if you're doing finished mowing or pre-harvest mowing, uh, I prefer a flail chopper. Uh, this actually is a recommendation. I prefer a flail chopper because it cuts the chunks of whatever it is, smaller pieces, and they decay quicker. And uh, a carousel, like a typical lawnmower, will leave longer pieces of grass, and it makes uh, excellent rodent bedding. So our rodent question uh, would possibly be alleviated by a good flail chop finish mower, especially in the autumn of the year. Uh, so there's not a lot of long, dead brown grasses around as nest material for, for rodents. Is that kind of open-ended enough answer? Either way. <laughs> <laughs> um, folks, we, we've gone over two hours now. I'm going to call it here. If you feel like you haven't got enough of Mark, you've got a sweet <laughs> offer on the table to get a whole lot more of it. So uh, I recommend you follow that link to um, the mikeajabi.com site. We've got a coupon code SDMC, and Mike has got a load of webinars that he's already recorded on there. Um, but thank you. For, I mean, we've got 125 of you that have just spent two hours with us, and that's fantastic. Cool. Yeah, it's we uh, Raleigh and I really like putting these on, and we hope we can, can keep doing it for a long time. Uh, next week is going to be my a follow up from last week's webinar. I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm working through the Saudi government to uh, reforest about 90 million acres of desert. And uh, we'll do some of the human systems on that and a lot of the ecological systems on that. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming on to Sustainable Design Masterclass. Thank you to Wayne and Mark as well. We love the work you guys are doing and uh, wish you all the success that I think will come your way. And uh, I'm nice calling it a night. Good night, Thank everybody. You, uh, Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Probably Thank should you. come visit. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I'll be there. And again, everybody will get a follow up email with uh, the replay link, which is going to stay up for a short amount of time, and the link to the ecological action team. And next month is all drylands month. So get ready for terraforming. Get ready for learning how to grow, grow the best olives, get ready to learn from the best people in drylands areas and desert areas, You're learning from extreme people doing extreme things to restore their world. So thanks, everybody. Keep designing a better world. Have a great day. Have a good weekend. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.